I was reflecting this morning, I thought of a church, probably not unlike the church you attend, and, and the church probably 10 years ago sent a group to South Africa. I know we have some people here from South Africa, and this was a, a specific calling there, and it was a, a shanty town. It, it was worse than, than a ghetto. Uh, they just lived in, in discarded tin and, and cardboard, and these uh, American volunteers came, and, and they have kind of paired up with uh, interpreters, and they walked through, there weren't really even alleys, but they walked through these dwelling places. And so they developed a system where they would put a, uh, a green little sticky note on one little dwelling place to show that they had spoken with someone that was there. But if nobody was there, they would put a different colored one on the outside of the, the, the tin or the cardboard. And so as they crisscrossed through there sharing the gospel, there wasn't a lot of openness, but some people responded. And it was the end of the day, dusty, hot. They began to walk down a dirt road to get into the air-conditioned van to go to the air-conditioned hotel. And they looked up and there was a, an older gentleman shuffling toward them as fast as he could and uh, shouting something. They couldn't understand the dialect, but the first thing they noticed was he had a sticky note on his forehead. And that kind of got their attention. And finally, the interpreter said, oh, I hear what he's saying. He's saying, I want to be found. I want to be found. And so they got out of the van and shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And this older gentleman, for the first time, heard the gospel. And he said, yes. Friend, there are a billion and a half people on planet Earth who want to be found. And they've never heard. They can't turn on KSBJ. No one's ever handed them a track. They don't even know a Bible exists. And they're still waiting for someone to come. If you don't know me, that was our journey in life. My wife and I, Susie, I grew up not too far from here near North Houston at the age of nine at a church that preached the gospel, taught the word, I came to faith, I was baptized at the age of 13. The Lord threw a curve. I went to Glorietta, New Mexico to youth camp. And uh, my father was a coach. I was going to be a coach. I was going to play as long as I could. And the Lord said, you're going to be a minister. And I said, you got the wrong person. No one in my family tree is a minister. And uh, he didn't let me go. Age of 17, joined my first church staff. Uh, met my wife at then Houston Baptist University. Our first week as freshmen, got married three years later. Year after that, we moved up to go to Southwestern Seminary. I remember when I registered there my first day at the seminary, a long line began to talk to the young man next to me. He was a semester ahead of me and got to the front and registered. The first place, there were several lines. And the, the registrar signed my, my paper there, my registration form. And then he wrote uh, just an abbreviation, Matthew 5, 16. But what it looked like with Matthew 5, 26. Now, this sounds like a preacher story, but it's a true story. And I hate to have to say that, but uh, it, it actually did. And so uh, my buddy and I now that we've been in line for 30 minutes, he's a good friend, and I pulled out my Bible out of my, my briefcase, which was a backpack back in those days. And I opened my Bible to Matthew 5, 26, which probably is not one of your memory verses. And it says, truly, I say to you, you should not leave till you pay the last cent. That, that was my introduction to the seminary. And I thought I was ready to incur a bit of debt, but I didn't realize the cost here. And my, my new friend is like, that's kind of weird. And he said, let me go ask because he knew the register. And he said, no, it's 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so I was relieved there. But I do want to tell you that seminary cost me more than I thought it would. My very first class, that Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., walked in, Dr. Daniel Sanchez, teaching the very first class he ever taught. And it was intro to missiology was required on the reason I'm in the room. And uh, he said, okay, one of your assignments is you have to go interview a missionary. All right, I can do that. Well, actually, I heard that Dr. Baker James Cawthon, who was the retired president of the Foreign Mission Board, now called the International Mission Board, was a guest professor. I'm like, go to the top. I'll just call him, set an appointment, went to a little cubicle where he was. And what I discovered was I had my five or six lame interview questions. And as I interviewed him, he interviewed me. And I began to ask, where'd you start? How'd, you, how'd it go? All that stuff. And then finally said, young man, you're going to the mission field, aren't you? No, next. And uh, then, I mean, polite company, that's over with, isn't it? But no, it wasn't. And so at the next break, he said, well, tell me why you're not. You know the answer. I knew the answer. Remember the answer? The answer is what? God did not call me to the mission field, right? I call that our get out of jail free card. Okay, that's whatever the question 
God didn't call me to do that. I don't know what he called me to do, but he didn't call me to do that. And he was still impolite. And he said, how do you know? And look at the time. I, the interview's over. Thank you. I got to rush back and go have some time with God. I opened the New Testament. I'd read it before, but I read through it again, and I prayed for that four-letter word. You remember that four-letter word? Stay. Lord, it's got to be in there. If everybody goes, then who's going to tend the fires at home? And I read through, and thank God for Luke 8. If you remember the story, Jesus crosses the, the sea. He gets out, and there's a naked man in the tombs, and he's breaking chains, and he's cutting himself, and he's scaring everybody to death. And Jesus cast out the legion of demons into the swine. They run down the original Bay of Pigs right there. And then, remember the guy is in his right mind. He's dressed. And what does he say? I want to go. Jesus says, no. He says, stay. Man, I did a fist bump. I'm like, there it is. I found the out clause. I don't have to go. And then the Holy Spirit said, Martha, that's one out of a hundred. I'd grown up in a Baptist church. I was a royal ambassador. If you don't know what that is, it's kind of like Baptist Boy Scouts. And we studied missions. And I was taught as a little boy, and I prayed it. Lord, if you call me to missions, I'll go. And in the back of my mind, it's like, but you won't. And so I'm not worried about it. And then all of a sudden, his word seems to say, go. And so my prayer became, Lord, I'll go unless you call me to stay. And he never did. Jim Elliott, you recognize his name. Uh, Alkan Indians martyred as a young missionary. Elizabeth Elliott wrote the story, his, his wife. I love his quote. He said, we don't need a call. We need a kick in the pants. Uh, we probably need both. But it's God's divine will that his church mobilize to go. And purposefully today, the order has been the great commandment preceded the great commission. It actually does in scripture. Uh, in Deuteronomy, we actually find where Jesus quotes, to love the Lord your God with your, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Leviticus, we find, love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew 22, we've already looked where Jesus puts these together to make the greatest commandment. And then Matthew 28, he gives us the greatest commission. Again, this morning, I want to frame our time together with bracket uh, passages. One at the beginning of the last days from the, the time of Jesus' death, re resurrection, and soon ascension, Matthew 28. And we'll finish at what happens at the end of the last days. We'll look at the final picture there in the book of Revelation. But again, you know the story well. Several commissions, really. Luke, Mark, disputed ending of Mark. Uh, Acts 1.8, but it is Matthew 28, 19, and 20 that many of us learned growing up in the church to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That is the commission. That is what Jesus left us to do. Now, some people ask the question, well, is it a continuation of what was before, or is it a new day? And I believe the biblical answer is yes. That, that I believe it is a continuation. I like what Eric Mason wrote in his book. He said, many, in many ways, the commission is a re-commission. At the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply there in the garden. And is now taken to the spiritual realm, to all nations. When Acts begins, Luke begins writing, he says, what Jesus had begun to do and to teach in the Gospel of Luke, which means he continues to do and teach in, in the book of Acts. And many of you know the original title is simply Acts. And many people say Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts of the risen Lord Jesus. But it underscores that that is the call. And Acts 1.8 gives us the key to the Great Commission. Remember what it says, and you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That the commission without the presence of the Holy Spirit is an empty order. But God has so ordained that the Spirit came, we know Pentecost. And from there, the church is sent, it says, to all the nations. Actually, Luke 10 gave us kind of a foreshadowing. Some don't realize this. When Jesus sent out the 70, in that day, the table of nations consisted of 70. And so it was like a precursor. As I send these out to engage, they are showing what the church will do when I leave and when I ascend to the Father. I like to give a statement to remember when I speak, and this is it. The greatest commission is not so much an assignment, but an identity. It is not so much an assignment, 
but it's an identity. Many churches are struggling to do something missional, and the problem is they haven't become something missional. You can't do something contrary to your nature. And if missions is a department of your church organization of what you do, then it is only a segment of that which you engage. If it is the umbrella of what you do, then youth work, children's work, worship ministry, we go through all of it flows in the mission of God. And that is the Great Commission. Again, what do I say to people who've already taught this, preached this, read this, lived this? Uh, well, I, I've structured this way, one imperative and three instructions. And that'll help us with our, our structure this morning. And the imperative, I think most of us know, although I remember as a child, the, the evangelist read in the face saying that the command of the Great Commission is to go. And again, being a missionary for 30 years, I appreciate that, but that's actually not the command. Uh, you, you know it. The command is make disciples. That's the imperative of the Great Commission. There are three participles and one imperative, one command, make disciples. That sounds basic, and it's really not hard to understand. It's just very hard to do. If it weren't so hard to do, we'd be doing it well, and my friend, we're not, and we being collectively, we're not. Uh, again, I was overseas for most of my adult life, so I came back to a, a country that wasn't the same when I left, and so I'm trying to catch up. But uh, I read a study 20 years, I think it was finished in 2018, in the Southern Baptist Convention, which happens to be my heritage. I know we have many different, which is great, evangelical representatives today. But in 20 years, the Southern Baptist Convention collectively baptized 7.1 million people. So you know how much we, uh, we grew? We didn't. We declined. How do you add 7.1 million people and you have fewer people in the pew on Sunday than you did 20? Well, it's not hard to understand. You have decisions instead of disciples. You have transactions instead of transformation. You have people checking boxes and yet not following Christ. And therein lies the problem with making disciples. Uh, again, statistics, you can find what you want, but about 85% of churches are plateaued or declining. And at the heart of that is making disciples. Now, what I've discovered, there's almost a false optimism because if you have so many of these churches declining and 25 million Americans have left the church uh, in, in the last 25 years, let me double check, 65, 65 million Americans have left the church in the last 25 years. Well, what happens is many of them leave their churches going to another church thinking that that's the, the, the answer, that they're going to find a, a bigger, better program whatever. And then what happens is that's just one step. And then the next step is going to be, uh, I guess, NRG Stadium on Sundays. I'm, not that that's a sin, but it, it's going to be somewhere other than the gathered church. 65 millions. Now, interestingly, that statistic, about half of them still consider themselves Christians. So what does that mean? That means we don't understand what it means to be a biblical Christian. Uh, again, I'm not the judge. I'm not the one to say they, they got it wrong and we got it right. What I'm saying is people have not been discipled. And so now church is optional. You know, I, I was in Europe for many years and I saw the slogan, Jesus, yes, church, no. And, and I understand that. There's church hurt. There, there's history there. But for those to walk away, it tells me they were never anchored. And friend, discipleship is hard and it's messy, and it's costly. Uh, we arrived in Poland in 1991, then it was a communist country. 1996, uh, I was given responsibility over six countries there in the northern Baltic region. Uh, and there's a part of Russia, most people don't even know it's there, it's called Kaliningrad, and it's between Poland and Lithuania, and that just helped a lot of you, right? <laughs> so, but Poland's up north, Lithuania, first of the Baltic states. And it was basically a, a military base. Half a million people lived in Kaliningrad. And so I visited there in 1996, 1997, stayed with a, a Russian pastor. Uh, I'm fluent in Polish. My Russian is very rustic, but he had no English, so he didn't have a choice. And uh, this godly elderly man with his wife and two uh, sons lived in about a 700 foot square foot apartment. And uh, that evening after we ate a, a modest meal, he came and he, and he laid a document on the table in front of me. And at uh, first I tried to read the Cyrillic, which I can sound. And finally, I saw an English part of it. And what it was, it was a visa to immigrate to America. And I looked at it, and of course, I was going to rejoice with the brother until I looked, and it was expired. And I asked him, what happened? He said, well, my brother got out 15 years ago, and for 10 years, he's been working to try to get us a visa 
so that we can immigrate to the States. And again, his sons were so talented and the opportunities would have been so much greater in America. But then he looked at me and he said, but if I went, who would make disciples? He said, no. And not just for him, but for his wife and for his kids, his grandkids. Discipleship's costly. And yet he knew that it was worth the cost. Now we have some in here today, some of our partners, that is God's ministry on their hearts is to make disciples. And, and I would just ask you, avail yourself to them. They can help with, with systems, with material, with, uh, with teaching, with training to help us do it better, whether we're a ministry or a church. And so the imperative is make disciples. Well, the Lord gave three participles, three instructions to tell us, well, well, how do we do that? He didn't leave us to guess. And the instructions are encounter, immerse, and impact. Okay? Encounter, go. Go into all the world. Okay? And so that is a participle, but it carries the weight of, a, of an imperative because of the way it's, it's worded there. And so we need to avoid the extreme. It's not the command. The command is make disciples, but neither is, and I hope I don't step on too many feet. I've heard pastors say, it really just means as you go, you know, as you go through life, as you meander, say, God bless you if someone sneezes, you know, just be salt, be light. And the participle carries a bit more than that. It, it carries more intentionality, that we actually have a message that's worth sharing. Uh, we returned back to the States 2019. It may have been the same year that uh, we went to the movie. And uh, World War I-based movie called 1917. I'm sure some of you saw that. And uh, if you remember the movie, Lance Corporals uh, Blake and Schofield were sent across no man's land there in the trench warfare days. And uh, they had a message because what was happening, there was a battalion, one of their brothers was there. About 1,600 soldiers were about to, to walk into a trap set by the Nazis. And... Uh, they, they sent word, but the key was they had to get there before daybreak. Because if they got there after daybreak, it was too late. And as I was watching that, the Lord just gripped my heart to say, you know, good news too late is not good news. Uh, that, that they needed to go then. Go. Encounter. Intentional engagement is what that means. Uh, I often teach uh, evangelism, and, and one of my favorite definitions is D.T. Niles. He says evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And we can all do that. Sometimes we think, well, I'm not equipped, or all, you know, all these, these new arguments and apologetics, and until I read the, the latest book, I, I can't engage. But you can. Going for us out in the Missouri City, uh, two and a half years ago, we launched the campus there, and about a dozen, 15 of us went door to door and knocked on about 300 doors. And I'll never forget one lady who answered the door, four children, three her own and one foster. And uh, just began to talk to her about, we're starting a church just across Fifth Street from you. Uh, we want to meet our neighbors, we want to pray with you. Can, I, can, can we pray with you? And she just broke down, started crying, said my husband left me. Don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I, need, I need a church. And uh, we, we prayed together and she brought the four kids when we, when we launched, and probably two months into the, uh, the launch, her fifth grade daughter came to faith in Sunday school. Uh, our, our teacher shared the gospel there during the community group Sunday school hour for the children, and she said, I, I want to make that decision. And so I talked to her mom, and I said, well, meet with me, and I'll meet with you and your daughter. And so I went through the gospel, explained the gospel, and she said, yes, that's what I want to do. And, and there was a catch in my spirit, and, and this doesn't happen that often. I, I love this over-spiritualizing, but the Lord prompted me to say, tell her to come back next week and bring her dad. So I did. I said, you know, I want to meet one more time, come back next week. And I turned to the, her mom and said, I want you to tell your husband to come. Okay, I'll tell him. I don't know if he'll come or not. Well, the next week he did. And I sat down with the daughter, the, the mom, and the dad, and went through the gospel again and went through the mean of baptism and uh, went through the sinner's prayer just to help walk through that. And as I opened my eyes, the father was crying, and he said, I need to do this. And uh, I baptized the dad, and I baptized the daughter. The dad moved back in to the family. Two months later, I baptized the mom, and about a year later, I baptized the brother. And it was simply because a group of people went door to door to pray for a community where God was going to start his church. We're still called to go. Again, I lived in Europe nearly three uh, decades, and I, I'm not a future caster, but I think I've seen where America will be in 10 years, maybe 20. And I always put the caveat, unless, unless God sends an awakening. 
And he can. We've got to believe he can. And we're seeing on some college campuses some amazing things happen. And I'm praying that they will just become wildfire. But if they don't, I've seen what over-secularization looks like. And my friend, it's worse than what you imagine you see today. Uh, I talked with one of the uh, our workers. For 12 years, I led the work of Europe. And one of our workers in Sweden called me. He said, I had the strangest thing happen today. It's funny, but it's not. And uh, he'd met his Swedish neighbors, and, and like we do, had coffee, began that relational uh, work with them. And they said, you know, I, I think we can trust you. We're going to let you in on a secret. It's like, okay, what's that? He said, well, you know, Egrid, whatever her name was, Egrid and I are actually married. Now, no one in the building knows, so let's just keep that between us. And our worker's like, okay. You don't want people to know that you're married. And he's like, no, they'd make fun of us. And, and what kind of culture is it where you hide that you're married? Well, that's where Europe has gone. And that's where we need to go. Uh, as a missionary on furloughs, we came back to, uh, to Houston most of the time. I wrote a dissertation at Wake Forest during one furlough. And it is interesting as a missionary that when I would talk with pastors, I preach in different churches, Mission Sunday and all that, that uh, there's just like this conviction. And I always tell pastors, I don't call you to missions. You know, God does that. I just try to preach faithfully. And so, but they always felt like, well, let me tell you why I'm not on the field. You know, foreign food doesn't agree with me. I'm like, well, you're, you're right on there. Or, you know, I've got a, a hangnail and, you know, and it flares up. Some, sometimes. And, and I've heard them all, and my, my response is the same. You know, that's between you and the Lord. And uh, coming back to Houston, and again, I, I want to be gracious, but I have heard people say, you know what? We don't have to go anymore. God's brought all the nations to Houston. Well, praise the Lord, he has. And we've got some amazing uh, partners here working with refugees and immigrants and ESL. But, but the formula is not either or. Uh, and by the authority of God's word, it still says go. That has not expired. Now, uh, we do both. And, and the beauty of what we can do in Houston is we can actually train many of these internationals to go back and be more effective than we would ever be. So again, it, there, there are many aspects of that. But we must never come to the conclusion. Houston is the most diverse city in America. Therefore, the Great Commission does not apply to me. My friend, that's heresy. And that is not what God's word says. We need to encounter. We need to go. Now, for some, that means we need to go to Aleaf and to Bissonette. We need to go to the corridor on Southwest Freeway. But we also need to go to Myanmar and Madagascar. We need to go until all have heard. Encounter. Immerse. I use the word immerse. Obviously, the biblical word is baptize. But to some people like to redefine what baptize may or may not mean. Uh, obviously, the original word means to dip or to place underwater. And it's the sign of the new covenant, where a circumcision sign of the old covenant, baptism became the sign of the new covenant. And obviously it's hardwired into the commission that we go, what's the first thing he says? Then we immerse, we baptize. One of my dear friends served in China for many years. This was probably 20 years ago. And he attended an underground baptism. Not that it was underground, it was secretive baptism. And as he got there, he said, Mark, I will never forget. This 18, 19-year-old Chinese girl stood up in her white robe, and uh, they were about to have the baptism. And the elder said, well, let me ask you three questions. And, and, and the gist, basically, of the questions were, when you get captured and taken to jail, will you tell them who we are and where we gather? Or will you be faithful? I will be faithful. Okay. Secondly, when they torture you in that cell, and they say to divulge who else is following the Lord Jesus? Will you be faithful? I will be faithful. When they reach back to kill you, will you be faithful? I will be faithful. And then they baptized her. My friend told me that and he said, I think my preacher said, wear shorts and bring a towel. <laughs> Go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them. This public proclamation, obviously, is an important step. Why would it be hardwired to the Great Commission? Don't we think baptism is, yeah, it's important, but not? Well, it is that display, obviously from Romans 6, of the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord Jesus and us in Him. I remember we'd been in Poland about a year, 
And uh, I preached once a month. I was dear friends with the pastor. Again, context. Krakow, Poland, we'll just say a million people. The church, the Baptist church, 100 members. That's one hundredth of one percent. Okay. So we're not tripping over each other. And so I preached once a month. At the beginning, I preached in English. That's all I could speak. About a year into it, I would do maybe my introduction, maybe the first point in Polish, because that was about all I could do, about all they could listen to. And then the interpreter would stand up and we'd finish the message. And this Sunday I preached. And after the sermon, uh, a Polish man retired, said, do you have a minute? I said, sure. And he only spoke Polish. And he introduced himself. He said, my name is Adam. And he said, I, I want to tell you my story. He said, I, I was high up in the mining industry, which meant he was a communist. He lived in North Africa, Libya, and other places. Had a fairly prestigious lifestyle for that period. He said, about five years ago, I just struggled in my heart of hearts to, to, to realize, is God even real? And again, Poland's 95% Roman Catholic, and so that was his background. He said, I, I went to Mass every day on the way to work. I went and took communion, which they believe literally gives grace. Once a week, I went to confession there with the priest. I did that for months, and it didn't give me peace. And he said, one night, I just slipped out of bed with my wife still sleeping, and I just prayed, Lord, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you even exist. But if you do, when I retire soon, I'm going to find you. And I'm going to go to every stripe of church there is. And he said, so he's telling me this. He said, I've been to the Methodists. I went to the Presbyterian. I went to the Pentecostal. That was interesting. I went to a Jehovah's Witness. He didn't know one from the other. And he said, and the Baptists were last. Now, he never told me why we were last, but that's all right. And he finally made it to the Baptist. And he said, when you preach today, the Lord warmed my heart. And then he asked me a question I'll never forget. He said, will you teach me the Bible? Never met the man in my life. And then I will say beyond that, this was a God moment for this reason. Uh, at first I said, sure. How's Tuesday night? He said, that'll work. I said, where do you live? And he said, do you know the, the street Confederatska? I knew the names of three streets probably in Krakow. And I knew the name of the street Confederatska because I lived on it. It was the apartment building next to me. We met for Tuesday night. And before Tuesday night, a taxi driver heard that we were going to have a Bible study. He showed up. Uh, two other neighbors that we've been sharing with and were two of our dearest friends were not believers. They show up, and then a couple from the church came to encourage us. All four of those came to faith. And I stepped into that baptistry in another city with Adam as he proclaimed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became the leader of the senior adult department there at that church. And he was so excited to be able to share. He led his own daughter to the Lord who opened the first evangelical elementary school in the whole country, and he led his grandson to faith as well. Immerse, it means something to take that public stand. Uh, again, I, I mentioned Southwestern Seminary. I went to Southeastern later. Danny Aiken is the president. And I came across a quote. I tried to, to research and I couldn't find any hard data, so I, I share this loosely. But he said that about 50% of baptisms in our convention are re-baptisms. That means someone was baptized probably at 4, 5, 6, and then maybe at 15, 16, 22 they're re-baptized. Again, I don't know. I read other statistics said 40%. So I don't want to share that as fact. But I do want to share as fact that there are many. Uh, I, I would say at least a third of those that we baptize collectively have been baptized. Which even tells us further that we're not explaining first the gospel. We're not discipling. And we're not showing what baptism really means. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We need to make much of it because the commission makes much of it. So encounter, immerse, and impact. And I use that word instead of to, uh, to inform because that's basically how we, we treat the Great Commission is to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to understand all that I've commanded you. And so we have churches filled with people who know the knowledge of the gospel but don't live the obedience of the gospel. When I finished seminary at Southwestern, Susie and I moved to a little town in Celeste, Texas. I think we may have a, a road sign. It says 817, there's been a population growth. When we were there, it was 716. And so uh, 35 years later, look, it's, it's blowing and going. So it, it's a village. I mean, that, that's what it is. 
And uh, actually, when we arrived there, we were expecting our second child. We didn't have maternity insurance. And so uh, one of the farmers there said, well, Pastor Mark, you just come on. We'll pay for that child. I said, we pay for that child. We'll name it Celeste. And uh, glad it was a girl. And, uh, <laughs> and glad we didn't live in Nacogdoches. And so uh, went to Celeste, all of 25 years old. First pastor. I've been a youth pastor for eight years. And uh, my first Sunday, okay, First Sunday, we just arrived, put the boxes in the, the old parsonage, and uh, probably the oldest lady in the church stopped me. I've been treasurer for 48 years, you know. And uh, she said, Pastor, I could name 27 pastors we've had at this church. And my first thought is, honey, have we already unboxed <laughs> everything? The, the committee didn't mention that. I don't know why not, but they did not mention that about every two years, we run off pastors. And uh, all I knew to do was to go door to door. I, I knocked on every door in, in the village, in the town, to preach expositionally the word of God, to uh, disciple those who came to faith, and to take others with me to evangelize. That's all, all I knew, knew to do. Uh, the church was running about 100 when we arrived. That was 1986. And we left there from the mission field. We, we left at the end of 1990, having baptized 100 in those four years that the Lord called to himself through basic discipleship. It wasn't that we had flashy campaigns. We didn't even own a bounce house. Can you imagine that? And, uh, <laughs> and, and yet the Lord just touched hearts one at a time and brought them there. What I discovered that the discipleship problem in that church and in every church is that discipleship is here. It's what we know. In fact, in the day, maybe I'm showing my age, we used to call the hour before evening church, and if you're not sure what evening church is, go to Wikipedia, that it used to be on Sunday evenings. And an hour before evening church was discipleship. So, and if you went to discipleship from what was then called the Sunday school board, you got flyers or booklets and you got stickers. And you were a good disciple if you could fill up all the stickers. And so what we did was we had a lot of people that knew a lot, and yet they did very little in obedience. One thing we did differently overseas, and I had to be taught this. Uh, I had not seen the model. But what we decided to do was say, someone's not a disciple until they're obedient. Doesn't that sound radical? And so what we would train our missionaries to do is to go through Bible studies. Uh, the, the Bible study we did in my home, we, we just went through the Gospel of John. And so at the end of the study, we would have assignments for the teacher and the participants. For example, we say, okay, this week you could pray for three people. You could share your testimony with one, all right? For me, I'm going to pray for boom, boom, and boom, and I'm going to share the gospel with Cheshik, okay? What about you? Everybody take their turn. The next week we come back together, you know how we start? Maybe we sing a song, maybe we wouldn't. I say, okay, I prayed for these three. I met with Cheshik on Tuesday. I shared my testimony. He wasn't super Open, but we're going to meet again next week. Okay, go. Well, you know, I had a busy week. I, I prayed for these three, but I really didn't talk to them. Okay, what about you? What about you? What about you? Maybe one out of eight actually shared their testimony. You know what we do? Let's go over that lesson again. Okay, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Let, let's look again what happened. Why do we do that? Because we begin to teach discipleship is obedience. And if we say, okay, let's go to the next lesson, what we have communicated is we really don't expect you to do it. You know, you ought to. But if you don't, it's totally fine. And now we've got churches filled with people that are totally fine disobeying the word of the Lord. And so we do the same lesson. After about the third time you repeat the lesson, most people get it, and they either don't show up or they go and they share their testimony. And that's what discipleship is. As I referenced the movie 1917, there is that sense of urgency to be there by daybreak. It was less than a month ago I received a phone call. Uh, here, we, we just have a system where we rotate kind of pastoral and call, and it was my week. And a lady in one of our interloop campuses, father was moved into hospice. He was going off of dialysis by his choice. And she said, my, my father is, uh, is Roman Catholic. He, he grew up and of course, her mom was deceased. She was evangelical, and he's heard the gospel, but he, in his own words, he had no assurance. Would you go talk with him? And I said, sure, I'd love to. And I went to his hospice. He's, he's very alert and uh, just went through the gospel. And it was interesting because in Polish, I said it all the time. But it was the first time in English to say when we stand before God, he's not going to ask us what the church sign said outside. It's not about the church. 
It's not about the sacraments. It's not about the faith of your mom or your dad or your wife or your, your son. It's about the Lord Jesus. Are you trusting Jesus alone? And we went through Romans in different passages. And at the end of that conversation, he looked at me, he said, oh, Pastor, I'm trusting Jesus and only Jesus for my salvation. And uh, he couldn't wait to tell his daughter. His daughter got word to me that he had assurance and he has since passed on. Urgency. I could have said, you know, I think I have what he needs. Uh, can, can we do this, you know, in three or four weeks? Can he come to me? It's really a lot more convenient if, if he were to come to where I am. And so, so basically, instead of go and tell, we've said come and hear. And we're available. And the door is open. But somehow we're missing the impetus of the commission is to go into all the world. Uh, the name Leighton Ford may not mean much to this generation, it was Billy Graham's brother-in-law. And I actually met him because when I was planning a church in Warsaw, Poland, I was the dean of the Baptist seminary that we helped start actually 30 years ago. And uh, Leighton Ford came to lead a, a leadership weekend for us. And he told a story that has stayed with me. Now, uh, not a true story, uh, a legend, I guess. Uh, but as the story goes, and as I tell it, you'll be able to realize it's not necessarily a true story. But the, the story goes that on Easter evening, okay, the day of the resurrection, that Satan got together with his council of demons. And they said, what are we going to do? This just blows everything out of the water. And one said, well, why don't we just say it is not true? Okay, well, that's, that's one strategy. Why don't we say that uh, the guards slept and they stole the body? Okay, okay, that's one strategy. But word's going to get out. What do we do when word gets out? And finally, one crafty demon said, well, we can tell him that he, he rose again. And the other said, wait, no. he said, let me finish. We can tell him that he rose again, but they have all the time in the world to share the news. And though that may not be a true story, I believe it's a true strategy. And I believe the church is at ease in Zion thinking, all's well, I'll get around to the commission while one and a half billion people still wait. In Missouri City, I often say the gospel comes to us on the way to someone else. It always does. We must be the conduit through whom God blesses. As a network, we come together pursuing different aspects of that commission and different entrees, and we enter different doors, and that's the beauty of it, whether it's mental health or poverty alleviation or, or other ways or physical health needs. But it must lead us to the same message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. As I began, I said there were bracket passages this morning. We began with the commission to go into all the world. I want to tell you how it ends. You know, but let me remind you. There in Revelation, John, the beloved apostle, has been uh, deported out to the island of Patmos, which is just a, a rock of an island there, it says, because of his testimony. And he's told to write what you see. And I don't know if you ever realized, that's harder than to write what you hear. Because if you write what you hear, you're just, you're taking notation. But how do you describe what's never been seen? And he gets to chapter 7, and he's writing about 144,000. He gets to verse 9, and he says, And after these things I looked, and behold, a multitude which no one could count, from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. In the culmination, every nation is reached. Every nation is hears, and there's representatives there. This morning, we've said that the, the lamb became the goat. But you can also say the goat became the lamb to die for the sins of the world. And that message never grows old, my friend. Let's embrace the commission, and let's go. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you didn't leave us guessing, that you didn't ascend that day, with a simple question mark, but with a mandate. And Father, I am humbled every time I read it that there's no plan B. Angels aren't going to step in. 
if the church steps out. But Father, I know with all my heart that you will fulfill the commission, but I don't know with all my heart if the American church will be a tip of the spear or will be behind others. Father, use us locally, nationally, internationally to share that news that never grows old, that you gave your only son to a dying world. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.